Jennifer Joka will officially make her NASCAR Cup Series debut at Talladega Super Speedway. The SRX has announced their official TV broadcast lineup, and it looks like more discussions around infield access continue around the NASCAR garage. What's going on, guys? It's Daniel, and welcome back to our video. We got a lot of NASCAR stories to discuss here today on the channel. Let's go ahead and just jump straight to it. We're going to start off all the sponsorship announcements, the paint scheme announcements, and all the throwback paint schemes announcements as well. Let's go ahead and just jump straight into it. Let's go ahead and start off with Kyle Busch's 2021 M&M's Red Nose Day scheme that we will see this weekend at Richmond International Speedway. I don't think Kyle Busch has ran the same paint scheme since the beginning of the year, but I really do like this paint scheme a lot. It looks really, really awesome. Hopefully this will give Kyle Busch some luck going into this weekend at Richmond International Speedway. I really like this paint scheme quite a bit. I usually am a big fan of the M&M's paint schemes, and this one looks really, really awesome. The next paint scheme we're going to take a look at is Chase Briscoe's 2021 Global Weekly Mustang Scheme that we will see this weekend at Rich International Speedway as they will be honoring Global Weekly Mustang. But I find this paint scheme really, really awesome. It's The colors look really, really cool on the car as well. And it's a really, really good thing that they're honoring the Global Weekly Mustangs. This is a very, very awesome paint scheme as well. The next paint scheme we're going to take a look at is the first throwback paint scheme that it will be driven by Akinari Ogata that will be honoring Kenji Momoda there at Darlington International Speedway. This paint scheme is a very, very good tribute to Kenji Momoda, who was the first ever Japanese NASCAR driver to race in the NASCAR Truck Series. The paint scheme looks really, really cool. It is a really, really sick and really cool throwback to Kenji Momoda. I'm really happy that Akinari Ogata is going to be running this throwback paint scheme. The next paint scheme news we're going to talk about is Kevin Harvick's uh, paint scheme for Hunt Brothers Pizza. But this is something really, really cool about this Hunt Brothers Pizza throwback paint scheme. Here is what it is. Adam Stern reports that Kevin Harvick's car will have a QR code on its weekend at Richmond as part of a Hunt Brothers Pizza promotion set up by Flow Code. TV viewers will be able to scan their QR cards to take them to a sweepstakes entry page. This is what sponsors should be doing overall and what Hunt Brothers is doing and what Kevin Harvick's sponsors are doing. The activation that they're doing is what they need to be doing and bring more fans to sport. This is what I've been talking about. If sponsors would activate all the time, we wouldn't have to move the number of places on these cars probably. But unfortunately, we're probably going to do that. But I think that this is a really cool throwback, not throwback, really cool thing and promotion that Humperers is doing. And it'll be awesome to see this weekend at Richmond International Speedway. The next paint scheme news is another throwback paint scheme as we're going to be taking a look at the 2020 Camberwell throwback scheme that Daniel Suarez is expected to have at Darlington International Speedway. This is a design and a collaboration design by two of the best designers on NASCAR Twitter, Kyle Sykes, who I'm a big fan of, and Noah Sweet, also known as Lefty Designs. This paint scheme is really, really awesome. The color scheme on it is really, really cool. And it's a great throwback paint scheme overall as well. It's really, really cool. And it's really awesome to see that two of the best designers in the game are getting a lot of recognition. Great news overall there. The next throwback paint scheme we're going to be taking a look at is Jay Buford's 2021 Dan Gurney throwback, which is Hot Wheels being the major sponsor in that car. It is a throwback to Dan Gurney in the 1970s. This throwback paint scheme, like a lot of the other throwback paint schemes we're going to be talking about today, Looks absolutely excellent. The colors work very, very well on it, and it's a very, very awesome paint scheme. Really good news overall, and great to see that Jay Buford is honoring. Big Machine also is honoring Dan Gurney. The next paint scheme we're going to look at is Kurt Busch's 2021 2B scheme that we will see this weekend at Richmond International Speedway. I like this paint scheme somewhat, but there's some issues with the car, and the big issue on this car is that Monster Energy logo on the bottom of that car. If you got rid of that Monster Energy logo, this paint scheme would look absolutely really, really good, like a 9 out of 10. It would look good as Ross Chastain's paint scheme when he ran it at Phoenix International Speedway. But still, it's not a bad paint scheme overall, but if you remove the Monster Energy car and colors on that car on the bottom, I think that this paint scheme overall would look a lot better than it does. It's not a bad paint scheme, but it definitely could be a lot better to say at the least. The next paint scheme we're going to take a look at is Ryan Priest's 2020 Maxwell House scheme that I think we're going to see this weekend at Richmond International Speedway. I like this paint scheme a lot. It is really, really awesome. Ryan Priest, I know this is an entitlement with JT Doherty with their Kroger sponsorship and their brands. But this is a really good paint scheme overall, and it's great that Maxwell House is going to sponsor Ryan Priest this week, and I do also like this paint scheme quite a bit as well. The next paint scheme we're going to go ahead and take a look at is we're going to take a look at um, we're going to take a look at Bubba Wallace's Root Insurance scheme that was revealed earlier today by 2311 themselves. Remember, they already ran a Root Insurance car, but it is an inversion of that car. It's a different basic colors on the car than they originally had with Ty Dillon. This paint scheme looks 
absolutely incredible. I've really been a big fan of the 2311 uh, paint schemes we've seen so far this year from the beginning when he ran the original Root Insurance car for Ty Dillon to now the new Root Insurance car. The orange, the white, all the colors match up very, very well and brings out the color schemes of it as well. This is a very, very exciting and a very excellent paint scheme overall, and I cannot wait to see it out on the racetrack at Richmond International Speedway. The next paint scheme we're going to take a look at, we'll take, we're going to take a look at Josh Balicki's 2021 um, Lenny Pond throwback scheme, which will have Insurance King, which is a throwback to Lenny Pond's car in the 1980s, the Burger King scheme. This will have Insurance King on the car, but man, this, once again, is an excellent throwback paint scheme. It looks really, really, really incredible. I like the colors of it a lot. It looks really, really awesome. And is a great tribute to Lenny Pond, who was a really great NASCAR driver back in the day. And the final paint scheme news we're going to take a look at is Glenn, uh, Tyler Reddick's 2021 Patters View cat scheme that we will see this weekend at Richmond International Speedway. I like this game a lot. It looks looks really, really incredible, and I cannot wait to see it this weekend at Richmond. I really like this paint scheme a lot. It looks really, really awesome. That is for sure. As I'm currently editing today's video, it was just announced that Tire Pros has added two more races to Josh Berry's schedule for the 2021 season. They will sponsor him at, at Talladega and at Dover as well. I'm a little bit surprised they're sponsoring him at Talladega because I thought that Marcus Simonis was going to step up to the plate and sponsor him at Camping World at Talladega. I'm a little surprised on that. But it is really cool that Tire Pros is stepping up to the plate and sponsoring him. It's really, really awesome. I'm really, really happy overall for Josh Berry. He continues to pick up sponsorship. And hopefully more sponsors like Tire Pros can step up to the plate and work with Josh Berry going forward. And now we're going to go ahead and jump onto all the other major stories that we need to discuss here on today's episode. Let's go ahead and just jump straight into it. Let's start off with Quitrip, as they have been named the presenting sponsor for the Road America Cup Series race on July 4th. The name of the race is going to be called the Road America 250, sponsored by Quick Trip. Now, it's not Quick Trip. It's not the same brand as, like, Quick Trip, but they're basically associated with each other, if I'm not mistaken, if I don't remember correctly. They have a rivalry with each other. The, the Q1 and the K1 have a major rivalry. This is a major, major company up in Wisconsin, and I think that this is going to be a really cool to see that Quick Trip is stepping up to the plate, and they're going to sponsor. I'm really, really happy to see that they're going to be sponsoring the Road America. And it's also going to be called the Road America 250, which is also really really, really cool. Some of the names for the title sponsors for these races have been absolutely incredible, and this is a really, really cool tribute to Quitrip. Really, really awesome overall for sure. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode, as we're going to go ahead and talk about the NASCAR Pro Invitational once again. As according to Bob Pockers, he said that for the next race, a fan vote will determine a non-Cup Series NASCAR driver in the field. It also says that also Pro Invitational Series winners, past winners, and that currently race in the National Series, like the Cup Series, Truck Series, and Spanish Series, they would get in as well. That means Timmy Hill is also going to be in the Pro Invitational Series as well. I wasn't really a big fan of the Pro Invitational coming back at first, but I really like what they're doing now. I like that they're going to be doing a fan vote to get someone in that's kind of a fan driver, a driver that someone likes that isn't in the Cup Series. I think of people <coughs> like Roger Carruth who maybe could get in this event. I think of people like Parker Clayerman, Atlanta Castle, who have really, really big popular followings. Maybe Josh Berry as well could get in this event. This is a really, really cool opportunity for sure that the Pro Invitational is doing. This is really, really excellent news and great news overall on that front. And now we're going to go ahead and jump on to the next story of today's episode, as we're going to go ahead and talk about Colin Garrett. As was just announced a few minutes ago, that Colin Garrett is going to be driving the number 26 for Sam Hunt Racing at Talladega Super Speed, making his return to the NASCAR Xfinity Series. Colin Garrett, for those who don't know, has had associated with Sam Hunt Racing for quite a few years now, since around 2018. He drove 18 races for them in the at what was used to be called the Canyon Pro West, now the ARCA West Series, and he's been working as an interior mechanic with Sam Hunt Racing. So he's been working in the Sam Hunt Racing shop basically all year long, and this is really, really cool for Colin Garrett. Colin Garrett is only 20 years old, so he's a guy that has a lot of talent. He's shown what he, he could pretty much do so far in the NASCAR Xfinity Series. He's had some decent success with the Sam Hunt Racing, especially last year. He was contending for some top 20s with that team, and I think this is a really cool opportunity overall. I think that if he can stay up front, he could have a shot to win. I think anybody can win these super speed races, and if he avoids a big one and doesn't run into trouble, I think that Colin Garrett overall has a really good shot of contending for the win in the NASCAR Xfinity Series. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode. It was announced yesterday from Nice Motorsports 
That Matt Noyce is going to be crew team the number 44 entry for Nice Motorsports that rich, starting at Richmond International Speedway, for, starting with Jen Nolan this upcoming weekend in the Truck Series at Richmond International Speedway. Matt Noyce actually originally was a crew chief for Derek Cross earlier this year, but he was let go after not such very desirable starts, and he was replaced. I can't remember, about, remember who by, but he was replaced. I think it was Mark Hillens going to be the one who replaced him, if I'm not mistaken. So Jen Nolan is going to have a new crew chief in Matt Noyce this upcoming weekend. Hopefully Matt Noyce can bring his success to the 44 team, but I will be honest with you, after less desirable results, I don't know how he's going to do, but hopefully Matt Noyce is able to have some pretty good success overall going forward with Jet Nolan. I'm going to go ahead and jump on to the next story of today's episode. As it was announced today, that Goodyear is going to be the title sponsor for the Darlington Throwback Cup Series race on May the 9th. This is going to be Goodyear's first ever entitlement in North America in racing or even any sports in general in North America. So this is really, really awesome that Goodyear is going to be sponsoring the Darlington Throwback Weekend. There's also going to be something done with the tires. I think there's going to be a blue or white trim on the tires as well for this race. So this is going to be really, really awesome. I'm really happy that Goodyear is going to be sponsoring. It's really, really cool that Goodyear is going to become the title sponsor. And I think that they will overall do a great job sponsoring this event. This will be called the Goodyear 400. The Rebel 400 has got a name, and it's really, really awesome that they are going to be sponsoring that event. And now we're going to go ahead and jump on to the next stories of today's episode as we're going to go ahead and talk about the starting lineups for the Truck Series race and the Cup Series race as well. Let's start off with the Truck Series race as Ben Rose is going to be starting on the pole for the race at Richmond. I think Austin Hill is also going to start on the front row, if I'm not mistaken, for the Truck Series event. Uh, Ben Rose is pretty good at Richmond. He had decent success last year, and I also think the Thoros of Sport Cars have a really good shot to win the race as well. My pick going into the Truck Series event is going to be Kyle Busch, as Kyle Busch is going to be running the Truck Series event. I think that he's going to do a really good job overall, and I think he has a great shot overall of running up in the front. And then we jump up to the Cup Series next. Let's take a look at the Cup Series lineup now as... Martin Truex Jr., last week's winner at Richmond International Speedway, he's going to be starting the pole alongside Denny Hamlin, who will also be starting the front row, who ran very well. Both these guys have really good history at Richmond, so they both have a really good shot of running well in this upcoming event. I'm not telling you my pick is going to be winning. You'll have to check out my channel later this week or tomorrow when I tell you my picks for the Cup Series race, but check that out tomorrow. But yeah, those are the starting lineups for the Cup Series and the Truck Series races that will be taking this place this weekend at Richmond International Speedway. And now we're going to go ahead and jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're going to go ahead and talk about Jimmy Johnson. We're talking about some IndyCar, some IndyCar news today. That's right. So Jimmy Johnson said in an interview with Jenna Fryer that he is currently open to running the 2022 Indianapolis 500, running it next year. What's really, really crazy is that about a year or two ago, Jimmy Johnson basically said he was ruling out of not even running the Indy 500, but with the safety that IndyCar has been having with that extra stuff they've been doing with the visor and all that stuff on the front of that car, they've been doing a lot of safety, and it's been opening up some drivers' eyes to potentially maybe running the Indianapolis 500 that would never have thought of potentially running the Indianapolis 500. Joey Logano earlier this week said that he's very intrigued of running the Indy 500. He said he also got COVID-19 this past week. But he also said he was open to running the Indianapolis 500. Jimmy Johnson has been getting more and more likely that he was going to not run the Indy 500. He didn't say at the beginning if he was going to run or not. And now he's saying he's open to running it. This is really, really awesome news that Jimmy Johnson is not open running the Indianapolis 500. I mean, it's so, so cool to think about. And maybe just maybe Jimmy Johnson may be able to do the NASCAR IndyCar doubleheader next year, maybe, where he runs the Coke 600, maybe comes back and runs a, cup, a one-off Cup Series race in the Coke 600, and then runs Indianapolis 500 earlier that day. Maybe? Who really knows? But yeah, I'm really, really excited to hear the news that Jimmy Johnson is open to run the IndyCar race, the Indianapolis 500. That's really, really awesome, and I can't wait to see if that gets officially true and it gets confirmed or not. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode, as we're going to go ahead and talk about Ryan Reed. As it was announced today by CMI Motorsports that Ryan Reed is going to be making his NASCAR Truck Series return, he'll be racing for CMI Motorsports in the number 49 truck at Richmond International Speedway. For those of you who don't, do not know much about Ryan Reed, Ryan Reed is a two-time NASCAR Spinning Series winner. He won the 2015 and the 2017 season openers at Daytona in the NASCAR Spinning Series for Roush Fenway Racing. But he's been kind of in and out of the sport over the last couple years. But like I said, he's going to be making his return to the NASCAR Truck Series. I'm really excited to see what Ryan Reed can do. It's been a few years since he's ran in a in NASCAR event in general. I think the last time he ran was 2019. And I think that was at Las Vegas for DGR Racing, if I'm not mistaken, a couple years ago. So it's been a few years since Ryan Reed has raced. 
The fortunate thing is that Ryan Reed is not in a very good truck. Let's be honest with ourselves. Ryan Reed does have a lot of talent. He was able to do some quite a few good things in the Xfinity Series when he raced. Unfortunately, he's driving for CMI Motorsports, which that truck team is absolutely crap. They're not a very, very fast team overall, and I don't think that he's going to perform very, very good, to be honest with you. I would be honest, be honest with you. If he even gets the top 35 and thinks that's a success for that team, there might be some rights that might help that organization overall. But I do not expect Ryan Reed to be very, very competitive with the team. I just don't think he's going to be that good, to be perfectly honest with you. I think he's absolutely going to struggle. I think he's not going to run up front at all. I think he's going to run in the back of the field because Ryan Reed, like I said, he's a good, he's a great, good race car driver, but he's not been, is not raced that much, and I don't think he's going to do very, very good, to be perfectly honest with you. And now we're going to go ahead and jump on to the next story of today's episode. Man, a lot of stuff to talk about, that's for sure. But next story we're going to talk about is the Nashville Fairgrounds as – a court is basically the schedule for the National Fairgrounds because we got some more to talk about. It's all about that. But National Fairgrounds conversation. The Bristol presentation is going to be on May 11th. The deal draft is going to be on June 8th. And a meeting to consider the contract is going to be July 12th. Remember, the contract has to be done by July 31st. But there have been a lot of concerns in regards to them maybe not even coming back as of right now in 2022, being ready for 2022 with the draft. I'm going to be real with y'all. I'm not surprised that they're not going to be ready by 2022. I think at the earliest that they're going to be ready to bring National Fairgrounds back to the track is going to be around 2023, to be perfectly honest with you, at the earliest. But there have been a lot of concerns with the noise complaints. So I know a lot of people have been saying, oh, there's been a lot of noise issues with the track and there's been a lot of noise problems. Well, that's why you don't move to a racetrack that's been there for 104, basically almost 110 years. Why would you move to a racetrack that's been there since 1904 and complain about it, which has been there longer than you? If the reason that they can't have this race is because of noise, that's going to be really, really stupid and really, really frustrating. I hope that isn't the case, to be honest with you, but I think that's going to be the case, and that's really, really stupid, and it's really, really unfortunate to say at the least. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode, as we're going to go ahead and talk about the Marsville Speedway TV ratings from this past weekend. According to Bob Pockers and Adam Stern, Marzo Speedweeks earned a 2.299 million viewers and a 1.37 rating for, sun, for this weekend's race at Marzo. This is up 34% from the 1.72 million viewers from last year's race, but keep this in mind, this was on a Wednesday night. But it's off 7% and 6% respectively from the March 2019 race, which had a 2.463 million viewers. I'll be honest with you, I'm not surprised the ratings are down for this event, especially since this race was originally supposed to run on Saturday compared to Sunday, though yes, you could potentially get more viewers on Sunday. It's no surprise that a race was supposed to be originally supposed to run on Saturday. It got moved to Sunday, and unfortunately, it got affected by weather, and the ratings, unfortunately, are down. It doesn't surprise me one bit, especially this race being only in the 2.5 or 2.4 range. It really isn't a surprise either, to be honest with you, that there's less viewers, especially on Fox Sports 1. It's not terrible, to be honest with you. I think it's a win, to be honest with you, that it wasn't down that much, considering all things considered. But, yeah, it is unfortunate ratings are down a little bit, to be honest with you, but it's not really the end of the world, to be perfectly honest with you. And now we're going to jump onto the next story of today's episode, as we're going to go ahead and talk about infield access once again. As it was, report, it was reported by last night by Adam Stern that NASCAR will soon start letting a single-digit number of vaccinated sponsors slash guests per team to get back into the garage pit road. He also said that vaccinated team owners will also start being able to go back and forth from the infield to suites once again. This is really, really exciting news, to be honest with you, that infield access is going to start becoming a thing more and more likely once again. It's good for sponsors and teams that teams can start becoming, especially if they're vaccinated, that these sponsors you come in. A lot of these smaller teams basically have been struggling. They have not been able to pay as much with the sponsors not being able to come to the events because a lot of times when sponsors, they want to be able to go to the event and experience the event for themselves. And the fact now that this is going to start becoming a thing is really, really good news. And it also doesn't surprise me that you're going to be required, at least right now required to have the vaccine to basically get into the infield. It doesn't surprise me. And it doesn't surprise me that they're really only starting to bring it. I'll be honest with you. I really want everything to open back up very, very quickly, but I also understand the safety and health protocols of everything to get everything back up and flowing. But yeah, this is really, really exciting news overall that infield access is going to start becoming a thing once again here in the foreseeable future. And great news overall. I think by the end of time we get to the end of summer, I think a lot of things are going to be coming, become a much more normal. And by the time as more people continue to get the vaccine, I think things are going to start becoming much more normal and things will get better sooner once again. And now we're going to go ahead and jump onto the next story of today's episode as we're going to go ahead and talk about the SRX broadcast lineup. 
That's right. Today it was announced from the SRX themselves, the 2021 broadcast lineup for the SRX. Let's take a look at that. So it was announced today that Alan Beswick, that's right, you heard that right. Alan Beswick, legendary NASCAR reporter, IndyCar reporter, is going to be coming back and he's going to be commentating on CBS. Also joining him is going to be Lindsay Zarniak, who is going to be the host before the events. Lindsay Zarniak has worked with, with Fox and other brands and also TNT as well for NASCAR. She will be working in that as well. Brad Doherty, who's been working with NASCAR and NBC, worked at ESPN NASCAR ESPN, who has had a relationship with Alan Bessick for a couple years now. He will be once again working with them as a basically like a driver commentator and all this stuff. Not driver commentator, but an owner commentator. And Matt Yoakum is going to be a pit reporter. Matt Yoakum this past year was fired from NASCAR and Fox. He will basically be joining SRX and joining CBS as well. It was also announced today that Danica Patrick, James Hinchcliffe, and Dario Franchitti are going to commentate, commentate two races each this year. This is an all-star lineup of TV broadcasters. Alan Beswick, for me, is one of my favorite commentators of all time. He's made some of the greatest calls. Remember the 2001 Pepsi 400 call? He made that great football call in the college football games a few years ago. He's called awesome call the 2016 Indianapolis 500. Call the 2012 finish between Marcus Ambrose and Brad Keselowski. He's someone that, though, in different sports, he knows how to bring the energy. He knows how to bring it. I think that he will do an excellent job overall in the SRX. And all the other people joining as well, it is really, really awesome. This is an absolutely excellent broadcast lineup that SRX has gone out and choose. I'm so happy that Alan Bestwick is back. It's been so long since Alan Bestwick has been able to commentate, and I'm so happy that he's coming back. I cannot tell you how excited I am. My one concern overall for this whole SRX thing is the driver lineup. Everything else about the, all the hype, the car looks really, really cool, and all the things. My really big concern is the driver lineup because there's not a lot of all-star drivers in the field and not a lot of popular, relevant drivers going in this field. But other than that, man, I'm starting to get a little more hype about this XRX because this this commentary booth and this lineup is absolutely incredible. It looks awesome. I'm so happy that Alan Bestwick I'm just so happy Alan Bestwick gets back. It's, it's so awesome to see him coming back, and I'm, I'm glad he's commentating once again. And now we're going to go ahead and jump on to the final story of today's episode. As was announced yesterday by Rick Ware Racing, that Jennifer Jo Cobb is officially making her NASCAR Cup Series debut next weekend at Talladega Super Speedway, driving the number 15 car for Rick Ware Racing with Arrowhead as her major sponsor on that car for that upcoming race. I cannot tell you how exciting I am for Jennifer Jo Cobb making her NASCAR Cup Series debut. She is someone who's worked her ass off and worked her tail off to try to make it in NASCAR, to make her dream. She's been in this sport for like 15 or 20 years. She's been around for a very, very long time in the NASCAR Truck Series, driving for her own organization, just trying to make it a living, just trying to do what she can do. And now she finally gets to fill her dreams and make her NASCAR Cup Series debut. This is also going to be the first time that a female is making a start in the NASCAR Cup Series since Danica Patrick raced in 2018 at the Daytona 500. So it's been over three years since a female race in the NASCAR Cup Series. To me, this is really, really awesome that Jennifer Jo Cobb is making her NASCAR Cup Series debut. I've been a big fan of Jennifer Jo Cobb. Yes, she's running in the back all the time. She's running five or six laps down. A lot of times she's not competitive. She's really never had an opportunity to be competitive. I know that she ran the 27 car for uh, Baker Curb in the Xfinity Series 2010. But let's be honest, that team in 2010, they were absolutely not that good. And it was super speedway. And she crashed out of that. To me, though, this is absolutely incredible. It's been all, I've been wanting this an opportunity for Jennifer Cobb. This is something that should have been done years ago. This is something I've been wanting for Jennifer Jo Cobb to get an opportunity to race in the Cup Series. And she finally gets to live her dream, at least making her Cup Series debut. And I know a lot of you are thinking, is this because of the James Davidson and Cody Wurst stuff? No, Bob Hawkers got actually asked and told, uh, asked and got told basically that this has basically been planned for a while. So this is really, really awesome that she's going to be making her NASCAR Cup Series debut. I think honestly, her goal: just try to stand a lead lap, just try to be competitive, and get his, and do the best you can in this event. And this might be your only time to run, but hey, at least Jennifer Joka gets at least race one time in the NASCAR Cup Series. I'm really, really excited for it if she gets an opportunity to make her NASCAR Cup Series debut. And I hope that she can live and do the best she can with it because this is really, really awesome. And I'm really, really happy for Jennifer Jokov. And I'm hoping that she can do very, very well with the Rick Ware Racing equipment. I think that she'll do better than what Derek Cope did in this 15 car. Let's be honest, Derek Cope almost basically wrecked the field in the duels, basically stopped 50, going 15, 20, 20 miles an hour down the inside line. Could have caused the big one to wreck a ton of cars. 
I think this will do overall really, really good. But yeah, this is really, really awesome. And I cannot wait to see Jennifer Jokob make her NASCAR Cup Series debut for Rick Ware Racing at Talladega Super Speedway. So anyway, that is going to be for today's NASCAR news video. I want to thank you guys for watching. Please like, subscribe to the channel, notification so you know if I when a video does go live on my channel. Follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and support me on Patreon as well. Links are below for that. And combo your thoughts on today's video. What are your thoughts about Jennifer Jokob making her Cup Series debut for Rick Ware Racing? Do you think she's going to do very well in this car or not? Let me know in the comments below. And what are your thoughts about all the other stories, including the x Starts and Alan Bestwick making his return to the commentary booth? Let me know in the comments below. And like I said, if you enjoyed today's video, make sure you like you so YouTube can recommend more of these great videos out to guys. If you do that, I would greatly and truly appreciate it. Anyway, like I said, I want to thank you guys for watching today's video, and I'll see you guys next time. Take care, everybody.